Hi, Christine. Thanks for joining me, friend. Hey, good to see you. Yes, likewise. Uh, so there's a lot I want to talk to you about, about your projects and all the different things you've worked on. And we'll get into some of the specifics. But as you know, I really love to put all of that in the context of someone's life and really who they are. And uh, for me, I love to ask about people's life story. And that's uh, something I delight in. I don't know, like right now I'm I'm writing two novels right now. And I think one of my edges is in like really making a compelling character, like a, a full dimensional character. And um, this is for me a chance to learn about a person in the same way that you would a character in a novel, really, except they're a real live person who's even more full dimensional. So I love to ask people this question. And often there's really interesting ties between like, you know, things that have happened to them in their life and the specific interest they got into or how they see certain things. So um, yeah, with all that in mind, I'd love to ask you about your life story and feel free to share whatever you like in whatever way you like, at whatever length you like, short, long, epic tale, uh, <laughs> metaphorical, interpretive dance. It's all good. Interpretive dance. You know? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I mean, like lower the curtains. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. I I also would say I love that you do this as part of your podcasts mm -hmm. because I have been watching some episodes and I have some friends from the internet from Twitter that I've hung out a bunch of times and I've never gotten their life story. I just know them through like ideas and talking on the timeline. So um, yeah, I think it's like a cool part of your podcast. Mm -hmm. Um, Thank you. Okay, my life story. I have a, I have a spiel. There's a motorcycle outside. Have you heard that? But um, here's my spiel. I uh, so I was born in Tokyo, but I'm Chinese. And um, when I was four or five, I moved to Colorado. I spent my childhood in Colorado, and that's where I did like a lot of activities. So I was like doing gymnastics and ice skating and swimming and tennis and like piano and Chinese school and camping and skiing. Like it was like, just like a ton of activities, um, really like joyful childhood outdoors active. Um, so that's probably where I consider like my most home location. <laughs> um, when I was seventh grade, I moved to Cincinnati. So middle and high school, Cincinnati, like this kind uh, of rich kids public school. Um, so that was that. And then I started climbing also in Cincinnati. So um, that climbing arc took over <laughs> completely. <laughs> and I was very single track, like climbing girl for a long time. So basically like when I moved from Colorado to Cincinnati, um, I couldn't do gymnastics or skiing anymore because the gymnastics team was like expensive and like the there was no skiing um really in Cincinnati so I found climbing and that really opened my eyes to like a really wholesome community and scene it was kind of underground really small and um it was a whole different world from my high school so high school was sort of like this public school um fairly homogenous and the climbing world was like this dingy warehouse amongst other abandoned warehouses, pretty dark, full of chalk, full of like, you know, like shirtless dudes doing like one arm pull ups. It's like a dubstep reggae. <laughs> like, I'm the only girl in there. I'm like really socially awkward. Uh, so yeah, that was like a whole, I, like, I was like, I discovered this world and I was like, okay, I guess I'm here now. And I got really addicted. Then I went to, um, I actually chose part of like my decision to go to college, went to Notre Dame, um, was climbing. So um, that was a big thread, like through all of college, I was in the climbing club, I would go on trips to the River Gorge. Um, and yeah, that was like a big part of my social life. Um, then after college, I traveled around. So I went to South Africa for two months in a tent to go climbing. <laughs> um, then I went to Kentucky in a tent for four months. Um, it was a cool climbing area. Then I spent a month in Cali, Colombia, learning salsa dancing. 
And that was like a really great like solo travel period of my life. Um, uh, I think part of my like the impetus for doing that was study abroad in college, which really changed how I saw the world. Um, then what did I do? Then I had my first job um, in consulting and I was miserable and depressed. And the real life really hit me. And a series of other unfortunate events also hit me. And um, yeah, I kind of found myself in this deep hole. I had no friends. <laughs> um, I had to, yeah, work through some like financial instability too. Um, then uh, I got injured. So then <laughs> I lost climbing and that's when I got onto Twitter. And that was like a whole new arc. It's been like five years injury. Um, and I used to be very like offline, off the grid. Um, and instead I was like sedentary. I got into film, art, um, and just being very online. And I made a bunch of friends. Um, I was a designer. I did a career pivot. And yeah, now I'm here with a bunch of my like Twitter friends in Mexico City <laughs> who are hanging out. Um, yeah, that's kind of like a sketch of my life story. There's things that we could go more into, but um, yeah. <laughs> How did uh, it come about that you were born in Tokyo? Um, yeah, so my parents are from like Shenzhen, Hong Kong area, but um, my dad went to Japan for grad school and then they had my sister and I there. So, and yeah. what occasioned the move to Colorado when you were four or five? It was my dad's job. So he had a few like career changes and that's why we were like moving around all over the place. Um, and moving around all over the place helped me, I think, like just become really flexible or like adaptable to many different cultures and like bubbles. Um, even like the recognition of like, this is, we're always in some kind of climate <laughs> is really important. Um, but yeah, career changes mostly for every big move. But yeah, I forgot to mention my parents moved to Idaho while I was in school. So now they're in Idaho. And after uh, my stint six years in the Bay Area, I moved to LA. So that's where I currently live. Yeah. Were there any virtues that you can remember your parents trying to instill in you or any like life lessons they tried to teach you? Hard work, work ethic. Um, I remember crying a lot in the car to elementary school because my dad was teaching us like the multiplication tables and we had to like recite them on the drive down. And uh then we had one hour piano practice every day. And that was always a struggle for a kid. I'm like squirming in my seat. Like, <laughs> and he'll be like, I don't hear you. I'm like, <laughs> blink, you know, like, um, let's see. What else? Uh, being like careful, like being uh, not wasting food. <laughs> so like very like Asian traits. Uh, um, there's like the like idea that if you um, don't finish rice, all your rice in your bowl, then you'll get freckles. And I have tons of freckles. So, you know, maybe I didn't finish all the rice in my bowl. Um, let's see. Also, definitely like growth mindset. My parents are really big on that. They're like, um, no matter what, it's like another Chinese like, um, like, folklore about like this guy this farmer who like has a son and he the son has like a horse um but then he's riding the horse and he breaks his leg and it's like an unfortunate accident but then um because he broke his leg he wasn't enlisted in the army and so it was actually like a fortunate thing and like the idea that through ups and downs you never really know like it's like teaching like equanimity <laughs> so, mm. so um things like that um yeah mm. <laughs> do you have any memories of like childhood stories or events that happened to you that like you look back on and go, like, oh, that was pretty significant, like sort of formative childhood 
stories, things that happened to you when you were younger? Something that my mom talks about a lot that I'm like, oh, I guess that was a big deal. Um, I think she, they were kind of like short strapped to like actually uh, like watch us. Like my mom was in school for like accounting and my dad was working and my sister and I were like, what, like six and eight or something like that. So we were given a lot of freedom. So I would, we would wake up and I would like bike to swim class. It's like an hour, I don't know, a mile plus away. We would just kind of leave and go biking. And then like, we'll bike over to the library for a few hours. And then we'll bike over to like the tennis, like the, the activities were like babysitting. And like mm. climbing was also babysitting for me. Like I spent like five hours in the climbing gym. I spent like eight hours a day in the library on the summers. And there's no cell phone. So it'd be like, okay, go to the library. And I'll like bike to the library. And then she'll be like, at four o'clock, come to the lobby. And I'll kind of like wander around the lobby and then we'll find each other <laughs> at 4 p.m. So I think I probably like got like a lot of freedom and independence and like probably agency through this kind of like, you're interested to bike on your own through the city of like Broomfield and go to these things that we have told you to like, you know, go to some class with your friends, you know, and it's like, yeah, I guess I did all that. <laughs> yeah. And what did you, what did, you might've said, but what did you study in school? Um, I studied information systems. It's hmm. like MIS, Managed Information Systems. Um, and I also picked up a Chinese major just because I was, took enough Chinese classes um and that led into my like technology consulting job after school so mm -hmm. yeah yeah um I like I like information systems I like um sort of like organizing information um like diagrams and like frameworks and ways to slice and dice reality um but the consulting world was just like so not for me mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. How would you characterize the shape of your time on Twitter so far and like what that's been like for you? Mm -hmm. Um, I've been having a really good time. <laughs> uh, it began like with many things. I was I think like uh, I, I, it was just me in my like little dark corner. <laughs> I had zero fault. I deleted all my followers. I used to have some from like design or something. So I started from zero. And my first tweet was something like walking around Oakland, looking at these plump pigeons and like resisting the urge to like give it a squeeze. And <laughs> it's like, me making jokes to myself sort of uh and actually you were a big part of me joining twitter um so my good friend slash x um was on twitter looking for a while he got he like showed me twitter and he showed me visa and the friendly ambitious nerds and i just like totally ate the friendly ambitious nerds ebook in like one sitting um, at the same time, my therapist at the time introduced me to IFS and that like blew my mind. I was like, just the idea, I was already a big fan of Inside Out for this reason. There's just the like verbalizing the idea of like the mind being multiple, like just resonated so intuitively with me that I was like, this is changing in like everything about how I see myself. Um, and around that time, I saw Visa and Nick Camerata tweeting about parts work. And Nick was like, here's me talking to my parts. Hey, baby, Nick, what are you up to? And he just like did this whole tweet thread that um, once I saw that, I was like sold. And, I, and then I read your guide to Twitter. And I use all these things to be like, OK, I guess I'm now on Twitter. And I wrote a little pigeon post. And then I followed Visa and Nick. And I was like, who's talking about IFS? I really want to talk about IFS. What's it like for you? It's totally changing my like personality, like not my personality, but like how I am. And 
two weeks after that, Pranab found me and then you reached out, which was extremely bewildering because I had just read your article. <laughs> um, and Pranab was like, you wanted a video call? And I remember telling, asking Brian, like, is that normal? Like, do people like do video calls? Hmm. And Pranab was like, in six months, your life is going to change. <laughs> and it did. <laughs> Within six months, like, my friends who are here now, like Pranav Kat, um, Russell, a few others were like staying at my place in Oakland. We had just hosted like a huge 40, like a 40 person picnic in the Bay. Um, yeah, things just, the ball started rolling. Um, I started hosting. So it began with like IFS and like me and my little hole being like, I just want to talk about this. Then that led to like an IFS book club that led to like hosting. I had already felt a lot of, um, like desire to host book clubs and like movie nights and potlucks like I had that energy I just didn't have any friends <laughs> um, so then I found them through Twitter and um I just started hosting and that led to like meeting more people then I got a new job and that led to like a whole app creation like the ball just it was it felt like a snowball effect the entire time like it still feels like the snowball is just getting bigger and rolling and going so um hmm. Hmm. yeah <laughs> as you look back on all of that what do you think was the cause of you like having a good time and that snowball effect getting started like i can imagine that not being someone's experience where maybe it feels much more like quiet or uh they're not finding the friends that they really want to connect with like what do you think contributed to that being such a positive experience for you yeah, I think um, um, one thing is that something that I don't know people do actually for their own Twitter experiences is I I don't know if it's always the case, but it's often the case. I'll go through waves where my entire Twitter experience is my profile. <laughs> like I don't go on the timeline. <laughs> it's me on my tweets talking to myself. So mm. I'm having a good time just like responding to myself like I will tweet something and then another part of me will be like haha and another part of me will be like no you weirdo and another part of me will like I'll be like talking to myself and that will lead to gigantic threads and I think the threading was part of it probably um I probably already had like lots of backed up thoughts also um I think I was tweeting before I was on Twitter so I was like climbing in like Kentucky and in my journal I'll be like uh, here are my thoughts on like um, on like things that compound and I'll like write a little like blurb and like so it was like already like tweet formatted um, and so in the beginning I just found it nice to put those all on Twitter and then some of them took off and I was like oh that's cool people like enjoyed that um, so I think like having fun by myself was a big part of the beginning phases um, and like threading it too um, I never had any vision for my account. Like I was never like, I want to build a Twitter empire. You know, that was <laughs> never a thing. <laughs> so I didn't have any goals, <laughs> um, which means I never felt like disappointed, if that makes sense. I was never like, oh, why don't I have followers? Yeah, I, I never had that thought. It was like, I remember I like changed my avatar constantly because I was like entertaining myself. I was like, look, it's a mini me throughout the day. Now she's eating breakfast and now she's blah, blah, blah. And I also tied that in with like, I want to get more comfortable with taking selfies. So it was like all like a personal project that was like semi-public. And I think I didn't, I didn't think anyone would care. Like I expected to be in my own dark hole forever. Uh, but then there were like little skittering noises and the other corner of the hole. <laughs> I was like, who's that? And it was like vehicular man's laughter or something like that. And like, my first few mutuals came like to hang out. And I remember being so shocked. I was like, wow, like someone is responding to me. Super shocked that Pranav wanted a video call with me. Um, that was the beginning phases. I would say the idea of some kind of like critical mass was important to me with IFS, um, which is the idea, like there's like this idea that there's like, um the eight C's of self energy. And in the book, uh, No Bad Parts, he talks about 
this idea of critical mass and that if you could get like some amount of the 8C traits, some like volume of them, it starts to snowball. And I was like, that's what I wanted. That's the idea. I'm going to hit that critical mass and then it'll all snowball from there. And I think it kind of did. Um, and similarly, I think hosting led to more of a snowball effect. And um, I also enjoy weaving things together. So I like try when I'm doing things, I'm not doing them randomly. I like want them to kind of work together to make an entire um, system that is harmonious. And even when I make friends on Twitter, even now I'm like, oh, I have friends in different cities now. And it feels like I'm actually building like a global web of friends. Um, so I don't know. So some of those things maybe led to like continued compounding effects of having fun on the internet. <laughs> Can you say more about the connection between the HCs and IFS and how you were thinking of that uh, in your experience of Twitter? Um, I think the... I would say the eight Cs with IFS is actually more about being myself and being like comfortable and building a sense of like self love and self compassion, um, feeling like I can hold myself and, um, yeah, and I the only like real relationship to that versus like momentum on Twitter is probably this idea of like um there are certain like uh, it's getting really abstract but like the idea of critical mass in any like realm of like critical mass of self-love or critical mass of like maybe even like um like uh hosting or like being engaged and like um that there are a certain points in time that are important to hit or like if you hit them it's not like especially with hosting like um the first time might be really daunting but even just doing that first event is a big deal because after that point in time um everything else is easier like the that one moment you hit like three c traits and then like the next five are so easy and like knowing that makes it easier to put in the effort because it's not going to take it's not going to be a total slog, you know? It's like, no, there's like little mo moments in time and that's what you're going for. If you hit those, then you hit this little like slide and it's like chill for a bit. And then you have to hit another one and then you like slide for a bit. So like that was just helpful, I think, for like approaching things. Um, have you ever had any difficult or challenging or unpleasant experiences through Twitter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> mostly with weird energy <laughs> and uh, parasocial dynamics and guys uh, like being weird at me. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I think like being a girl on Twitter is you're already in like, a, it's like what, like the ratio is like 10 guys to a girl. Mm. Um, I also talk a lot about my innermost thoughts and feelings, which means that people uh, feel like they know me and I'll get like really uh, personal like DMs and they'll be like, I'm going through this thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, wow. And in the beginning with IFS, I was like, responding to everyone <laughs> but now it's like okay like too much there's like phases um I'll get like uh I mean yeah like I don't know sometimes people will expect you to know them or they'll um expect you to they will want a certain degree of intimacy or they will expect a certain degree of intimacy and attention and time that I don't know them well enough to give them that. Um, so I've definitely had some in-person experiences where guys will be like, hey, like either they'll like follow me around or they'll be like, hey, can we talk? And then they'll turn into this like whole thing where like they want to be like really intimate. And like, I didn't want that 
anyway like I don't know it was just like why am I spending all this time here we I, I like just I don't know you well enough for this like things like that um yeah but like I think like the good outweighs the bad by far <laughs> for me I think there's like a stint earlier this year in April where I had like three or four like bad experiences in a row and it actually made me feel very paranoid I also had someone get really mad at me for like a gender take um but it was like removed from like the context like I don't know like people will they'll take one slice of something you say and assume so many things about the type of person you are and where you came from and what you meant and they'll just yeah they'll take one data point and turn it into an entire human being and like I'm like this isn't that's not what I meant you didn't even like yeah you just made a bunch of assumptions um so that that happens um mm. yeah what advice would you give another woman who was maybe getting started on Twitter or social media in general about like how to maximize the good parts and fend off the parts that don't feel so good? Um, something I really like about Twitter is that I think it helps you find your voice. So I think I used to think that I didn't know how to write about movies. And I had tried writing like some like film reviews before and I was like this feels like very forced standardized writing um but tweeting is so low bare like low effort that I think I had a somewhat unique voice from the start where I'll be like this film makes me feel like I'm eating a strawberry or something and people liked it and like through that feedback loop I found my voice more so I would encourage girls to just start like or like I don't know any, any, any lurker so just like start saying things and you get such an immediate feedback loop of like what was interesting to others or what they liked about it that um, it's just really nice for helping you find parts of yourself that you like or parts of yourself that you want to explore. Um, in terms of like getting more good instead of bad um, boundaries, I worked a lot on like phrasing <laughs> and at first it was like really hard for me I'll just be like thank you thank you thank you to like like this like a lot of incoming messages and and then and then I went into the phase of like stop like you're overwhelming me and like that also felt kind of like too much sometimes because then they'll be like Meh, and I'll be like I didn't mean to like hurt you um and now I think I've landed on a good phrase or two where I'm like hey, I didn't like that. Or like, hey, um, I'll like appreciate if you like stopped. Like, you know, I'll just like find ways to phrase it. And um, yeah, like boundaries um, for that kind of thing. Um, what else? Um, I mute and block pretty easily. I don't block that easily, but I mute pretty aggressively whenever I feel like it liberally. Um, and I unmute liberally too. Um, I guess I would say treat it as your playground. There's no like major rules around like you can or can't like, um, yeah, I, I, I play with it, experiment. That's probably my advice. <laughs> see what works, see what doesn't. Um, and it's really nice. I would, I mean, I would encourage anyone just because I've made so many friends through it. And like, there are so many lovely people in these parts that I think the good just like massively outweighs the bad. Mm -hmm. um, what I want to ask you sign of the, kind of the same question that I asked about your experience with Twitter over time, but with IFS and parts work, like. What has your experience about doing parts work, your experience with doing parts work been like over time? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so I used to, I've always journaled a lot. Um, but I think like, even with journaling, I felt like I was confusing <laughs> to myself. <laughs> and it was sort of like, I'm journal, I'm journaling and I'm talking to myself and I'm like finding these threads, but 
I'm like going through a jungle and it's like, okay, like here's this plant. I don't know. It, it was just like very much like this wild, like overgrown feeling. Um, and like guys will be like, wow, you're so mysterious. And I'll be like, yeah, like I, I'm, I don't get it either. And then IFS really helped me find like threads. So I used to feel like this like jumbled ball of yarn. And I was like, uh, like it's all just jumbled up. I know there's a lot going on, but it's like this big ball of yarn. And after IFS, I was like, um, here's like this pink thread and here's this green thread and oh, they're knotted up right here. And here's like this blue thread. And here are like the main colors of thread in my ball of yarn. And like, it just helped me make sense of myself. Um, yeah. And so I first encountered it through my therapist. And the first thing I did was um, I mapped out all my parts. So I uh, like to draw or doodle and I, um, just doodled like really cute cartoon characters of my every part that was coming up because for me I'm like an extremely visual like person vivid imagination I get like wild dreams and my therapist took me through like a guided meditation um just like eight questions but what struck me is that immediately parts started to come up they're like ah hey <laughs> and it was like coming it was arising I didn't feel like I was making them up it was like oh this is a mode of existence that I am familiar with and I'll doodle them and uh I'll doodle them sort of like those like uh um sort of like like little memes like I'll put like here's my like uh catchphrase or like here are like these accessories that I like to carry around <laughs> and here's how old I am and they had these little like phrases around the uh, character and I was just mapping out the ones that were coming up and then I was really freaked out because the ones the illustrations have been showing up in my journals for years mm, wow <laughs> like, like these are just like modes these are just like ways that I show up and I draw them all the time in my journals and they show up in different ways and now I'm like this is my main cast um I did a solo retreat in a cabin in Ukiah, California. I thought it would be like an art retreat, but it turned into like an IFS retreat. And I just really got to know a lot of my parts. I was alone, no phone service, no Wi-Fi. And um, when you're alone like that, no Slack, no Twitter, no friends, my mind expanded into like many parts. And I just had these like conversations. <laughs> And I was like, am I losing my mind a little bit? Because I am just talking to all my parts in this cabin. And that was like the first um, phase of like getting to know, like just like the main cast of parts. Um, let's see. That was a big deal for me. I felt like there were so many um, like layers to them some of them had like exiles or like things that they were protecting and like just the act of um the pattern of like a self energy underlying many parts and the metaphor of like um some of these parts can get triggered and like the idea that you're like riding this bus and any of the parts can pull this like little line to stop the bus or they can like take over the bus um that was really powerful for me because I could feel when like a part of me was about to tug on that line and I could then attend to that part and the mapping of the parts that also allows you to separate from the part and you can now build a relationship with that part of you and so the initial phase was like okay like I noticed this kind of like experiential pattern mode character that comes up. How do I internally extend like um, like a hand? How do I build trust? And even just placing awareness on like, oh, like the first step is not to like say anything. You just like kind of like place awareness. <laughs> you know, it's like, introducing two cats to each other just like oh okay like <laughs> there's someone <laughs> <laughs> like um once yeah and I built 
trust and relation. Like I like, like, like with making friends, I just built relationships with each of these main parts that were coming up. And when I had done that, I felt so much inner like cohesion before it was like this jumbled mess. And I was like, whoa, like I make sense. I feel held. I have like, I can feel the trust, like these like strings almost. I can feel the relationships to different parts of me. I can feel that there is this like self energy that like, like when it was like, and like just like totally like pulled them all together into like alignment instead of like all these like floating strings that were getting knotted up. It was like, um, yeah, just really powerful for me to get to that point at all. And now I feel like I can always tap into like a feeling of self energy and being held. So it's like, oh, I'm triggered and I can like sort of try to get before I get like flooded or triggered, I can try to have that sensation of being held by myself. And um, that was probably phase one. There's kind of like a middle phase where um, I used to be really in my head, like thinking thoughts endlessly. Um, and I went to like this drum circle in Oakland, Lake Merritt, and you just like are always like drumming. And when you're drumming, you cannot actually think. If you think about when to hit the drum, you're already like a half beat too late. Um, so I got used to the sensation of just going with it, like not thinking, just moving my body. And I also read somatic IFS. And that led into maybe like more of phase two, which was like, and more of where I'm at nowadays, which is um, like, I don't even have to like talk to my parts. There is just like a continual communication of like nonverbals. I don't even know how to describe it. Like there's like these like little gradations of like felt sense and you just kind of get a little more comfortable. It's like all like awareness and like, you typically doesn't even get to the point where I have to do that much parts work because it's just like the connection's already there and I'm just moving with it. Um, somatic IFS also talked about self-touch. So like self, even like visualizing holding yourself or um, like touching yourself also for comfort is um, something that I found really powerful. The idea of like, sensing from the front of your body or from the back of your body to ground yourself. Like sometimes I'm talking to someone, I suddenly feel like overly drawn into, like I feel like heated in the front of my body and I'll just imagine like relating from the back of my body and that helps a lot. Um, and yeah, I think like once I hit the nonverbal phase, I actually haven't done a ton of like, I haven't felt the need to do tons of like serious parts work constantly um I do here and there but uh in terms of like who I am and how I exist and my relationship to myself I feel very like harmonious and peaceful um and like loved so it's, it's like a lot it's like night and day compared to pre-IFS where I used to like really hate myself, had low self-esteem, um, couldn't really like look at myself in the mirror, um, just like struggled a lot with feeling like I wasn't enough, um, had low social, like social anxiety. I don't know, I had like so many things and now I'm like, oh, like, wow, I got out of that. <laughs> like, that was such a reality. <laughs> I didn't think it would change, um, yeah. Do you have a sense of what might be at your edge internally right now? My growth edge? Um, yeah, especially with this sort of like way of relating to yourself or your inner world. I think honestly getting to a point where you feel like you are enough and you love yourself is a huge step. Like it takes a lot to get there and um. Yeah, that's a whole journey in itself. After that, I kind of tend to think that what I'm looking at now is trying to be more external facing. Like, you know, I like did a lot of inner work. Now I want to like mm. think about, um, I, I mean, I love to create, right? I like to like 
make a lot of stuff, but I want to be at a point where now I have messed around a lot. I have a lot of artifacts as evidence of this, and I want to sort of um, do the next level pass and do more remixing, distilling, finding what resonates, um, building, doing a better job than I did last time. Um, and like, yeah, like making bigger and higher quality things um, for more people is sort of what I would think. Um, How would you characterize the landscape of the different kinds of projects you've worked on over the last few years? Like there's a lot of different stuff that you've worked on and you know, I kind of have a story over here about how they might be related, but um, it's sort of from the outside and I wonder what that your experience of that is like from inside or how you make sense of it, if at all. Yeah, I remember when I was 23. So I told you like after my travel stint, I kind of fell into a big hole. The big hole was like career oriented. I also got sued. So that was in my other big hole. Um, and it was like a housing thing. Uh, but like, I remember like, and I changed careers to design and I was like depressed. Um, and I remember making this journal entry and like people I and I got out of all of that right I paid off my student loans too and like after like the first three years of like I don't know my adult life I was like I haven't done anything and my friends will be like what do you mean like you got out of a lawsuit you changed your career you like got out of like this relationship like you've been doing things and I'm like no I haven't created anything and I like had this journal entry of me on this rocket like flying into the cosmos and it was surrounded by like just like frantic stream of consciousness being like I want to do this I want to do that I want to make this like I just had so much creative compulsion and I was like I haven't done any of that stuff and I'm like freaking out I'm like drowning because of all of these things that I have not done because I'm busy like getting sued or something um so I think once I stabilized which was I got a design career perfect like good job stable um I really threw myself into creative projects um is there a cohesion to it um as you know I have many parts inside of me and they all have their own interests and so I feel like there's a very strong and rich inner landscape there's all kinds of climates, there's all kinds of directions it can go in. And I just try to give them time and space to have fun. <laughs> and so you'll see, like, I, I, I don't know, it's like, whatever I'm interested in, I'll like, go and do it. And I'll get, I get a little obsessive, too. So I'll like, go really hard, spend a lot of hours trying to do this thing. And then I also think part of like the whole work I think my parents taught me is I like, try to like finish things. So I care about like trying to have these like little packaged projects that I finish. I find that satisfying. Um, probably the nature of all those projects is also based on me being injured and having like an excess of energy because I couldn't climb and climbing used to be like all my, like all the projects in my life pre 23 years old were climbing. It was like, I'm climbing this route, I'm climbing that route, you know, I'm climbing like this super cool route. And then um, then the projects, they're literally called projects in climbing. They all became creative projects instead. And they just came out of whatever I was interested in. Um, I would say a strong theme is inner, exploring my inner landscape. That's probably, that's probably a good theme actually. Um, exploring like, parts of me like even like IFS is like exploring my inner world um film is a lot of like I call it like slice of inner life it's like what is it like to like drop into my eyes <laughs> it's like very like me based um journaling art piano they're all sort of like 
what is it like to be me in this moment and how do I express it? Um, except for the apps, probably social apps are really like more like um, community based and I uh, hosting art parties, all of that is more of um, like connection and interrelating. So I, I guess there's like a social theme too, just like this is my slice of inner life. What is your slice of inner life? They're so different, right? How I would love to like swap perspectives and get a sense of what it's like for you. Um, and like, um, yeah. And maybe like a third theme is probably something around like, I like strategy and frameworks and like um, making sure things like weave together and, are like a system so yeah let's dive into some of these areas of projects that you've worked on um i'd love to start with film um mm -hmm. maybe zooming out a little bit what are some of the filmmakers or films that have inspired you yeah oh so good um Okay, so one of my earliest threads was about this film. It's actually like a TV show series, film series called Scenes from a Marriage, directed by Ingmar Bergman. There's been like a remake of it. It's like a more modern remake, but the old Polish one is the one I watched that I really like. And it perfectly depicts my greatest fears of a marriage, which is, and I drew this like quadrant to describe this. It's like in the top, right? It's like, it's like a, it's it's like positive to negative emotion and then active to passive um, experiencing of it. And the scenes in a marriage explores this quadrant of passive negative emotion. And they are going through their lives, having a perfectly good marriage or so what it seems, but like it becomes clear that they're just apathetic and passive and like not really connecting and it's like this empty marriage where they talk about like oh we need to go to the doctors or like oh don't forget to pick up the laundry and um you watch them just fall apart in slow motion and it's like my biggest fear of like <laughs> especially back then um maybe like less so now but it was just like that was one that inspired me. And I sort of wanted the opposite, which is like watching someone maybe like fall in love in slow motion or like become more connected in slow motion. So the Before Sunrise trilogy by Richard Linklater sort of explores like this couple that falls in love and navigates romantic relationships. Um, but I actually remember thinking it was too cute and too romantic. And then I also liked um, my dinner with Andre, which is about these two characters that get dinner um, and like trade perspectives of like, how can you like this one guy is like off traveling and having these wild adventures and the other guy is like, you can't just do that shit, you know, like you can't just do that. <laughs> and they're trading perspectives. Um so something a lot, and I loved Richard, uh, Carly, Charlie Coffin, um, who Anomalisa was one of my like gateway films, which explores like this world where everyone has the same face and voice. It's like exploring like identity and like um, the guy who is the main character is like the salesman and his like promoting um, I think it's been a long time since I watched it. It's something he has like promoting like individuality, but like on this mass scale and like doesn't quite work. Um, and yeah, so I mean, I could go on about films that have inspired me, but like hmm. um, those are a few. So I love some of the ones, I, the ones you've mentioned that I've seen. I, yeah. Good. Yeah. I uh, just watched Making Life. A lot of like perspectives trading or like, Charlie Kaufman literally has a movie. Um, it's being John Malkovich, which you like walk through this little three foot door into someone's head and look through their eyes. So like, I really like that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What's it been like making your own films? 
Uh, similar to the beginning of Twitter, which is like me skittering around in my little backyard <laughs> with my tripod. <laughs> uh -huh. I and me banging my head against the wall. <laughs> it's like mm. I'm like still editing this short little thing I made with Jane, and like, oh my god, it's the editor I'm using like breaks every other second, mm. so I do like, one click and it like stops and like feel like spirals for like a few minutes and it's like really hard to work with so then I just get really frustrated um making stuff is hard <laughs> it's like <laughs> actually making something is so many like hours of just like oh my god <laughs> like this is hard um so yeah with that I it, mean it, it's fun it's experimentation at its core it's like I'm just going to go in my backyard and walk back and forth 12 times and videotape it. And I like, I have a lot of fun doing that. Um, and I'm like, look, this is the walk where I was expanded. And this is the one that was like contracted. Uh -huh. um, so it's, it's very experimental. I think that's what I enjoy about it. I'm like literally fucking around in the backyard, you know, or like Jane and I went to the farmer's market and I like took my phone and I got like a mason jar and I like filmed it like this through the farmer's mm -hmm. market. And it made for like this dreamy, like you're going underwater and like looking at flowers and it's a re recreating a dream sequence that I had kind of like a nightmare. Um, and it was a lot of fun. I don't know. Mm. It was like, it was very trippy because it felt like I was in my dream. And then Jane was like, I feel like I'm you. And she was like, are you following yourself in your dream? And I was like, I don't know. I never thought about that, but maybe I was the one that captured myself. Ah um so I, it's just fun I guess <laughs> mm. Mm. it's still fun I tried to make a I made a film with you through mm. the giving part program and man that was hard that was a good ambitious project because there is enough pressure to make me do something a little more ambitious and I was trying to do it right or something and everyone was like you have to write a script and I was like, I can't write a script. I That makes it not fun and I hate it. And I'd want to like never look at it again. So I didn't write a script. Um, so right now my relationship is still like in the having fun phase and not in like the actually doing anything in the way that you're supposed to do it. <laughs> yeah, fuck that. Uh, should do it the fun way for sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> huh. Can you describe how you think about that project now? I, yeah, um, so this is the Alone Time film. I made this film that it's actually probably inspired from my time alone in a cabin where I was like so alone that I was given enough space and silence for my personality to like also float apart into all of the layers that it is. And then it, all y'all were all hanging out in this yurt um and <clears throat> so in the film it's me going to a park and being like I love having time alone because I get to like be all of the parts that I am like when I'm talking with another person it's like me and you but when I'm alone I get to become like eight of me you know so in the park I become like eight versions of me um, it was a lot of fun, especially like the filming, because I had to like, <laughs> I drove my car to the park and I put my little tripod up there and I had eight changes of clothing and I would go and I had to like map out where along the picnic blanket, each character, which was a part of me, it was trippy. It was like, I actually dressed as a part of me and acted, tried to like be in the part and mentality that that part exists in. And I would act it out and I'd go back in the car and change my clothes and then go back out. Um, I think it was, I am both proud of it and a little bit like still a little embarrassed about it. <laughs> um, I'm proud of it because I, it feels very me. Like it feels very like an earnest attempt for me to express something about how I am 
the embarrassment is that I'm not a great actress and it's eight of me acting Mm -hmm. (laughs) and my voice acting is also not great I like cringe a little bit because I'm like man like my voice sounds kind of weird at this point and like look at my face Mm -hmm. and like I'm I'm, like clearly self-conscious in this shot and I also think like the plot arc, like there could have been like a stronger climactic point. And like, so I I still have like a critical like opinion of like how it could be better, but I loved the project. Like I loved that I did it. I love that it exists now, even though it's not perfect at all. I like did it and it took a lot out of me. So (laughs) there you have it. (laughs) I, I love it. I'm a big fan of that video. So. I'm glad. Yeah. I also think like when I think about projects and um, I'm also happy to like, if it's getting dark, I can roll the shades up. Um, uh, something with my projects, I talk about finishing projects, right? Um, something that I keep in mind is my limited resources and capacity. Like that is built into how I budget a project. And I can tell if I am running out of steam for a project. And if that's the case, then I will de-scope aggressively (laughs) to make sure that I still finish the project instead of letting it languish forever unfinished. And so I think near the tail end of that film, I was like, I am, I, I basically did all of the shots in one day. And I was like, I should redo all the shots (laughs) (laughs) and I had already like been editing the film at this point and I was like if I were a good creator I would redo everything and I was just honest with myself I was like I'm not going to be able to do that (laughs) I don't Mm. have enough emotional capacity to do that I will Mm. be too frustrated and I will give up so I just made it with like the first round of shots even though the sun is up in the first few shots and not in the later shots and like all of these things I just was like I gotta work with the capacity that I have and just finish because like now it's done you know it's like it exists it's done it's not perfect but at least I got it done and um that's better than never finishing it because I tried to perfect it by doing a whole nother round of filming so Totally. Where do, where do you think that value came from of finishing projects? Like, how do you think you learned that lesson? Um, I don't really think about finishing. I used to finish every book I read. Uh, that used to be like a thing. Um, now I don't because there's too many books. Mm-hmm. Um, I find it satisfying. I don't know. I like when I can point to something. Um, It might just be like experientially, I feel accomplished if I finish something. And I don't feel accomplished if I've only done it 80%. Mm -hmm. I like the finishing. Like, I don't know. It's like, it's done. I don't know. Mm. (laughs) Like, (laughs) I don't think I like necessarily learned it anyway. It's just like, I would rather have it done than not done. Cause then it might float around in my brain forever, you know, and sap up energy. So um, yeah, I don't have a strong answer for that one. <laughs> hmm. That's a good answer. Yeah. <laughs> Makes sense. Uh... Uh, I'm going to open my shades. Sure. okay I'm back so let's talk about the apps you've made I think there's like three three apps you've made right the the job board the third space and then cuties can you talk me through those apps and like the history of those projects yeah yeah um so they're all built on a platform called bubble I work at bubble 
the reason why I joined Bubble is to make projects like these. Mm. Um, I was impressed by Bubble when they recruited me because I had been trying in the past to make some kind of project where I exported all my Facebook messages with my friends and turned it into a booklet. Mm. And I was trying to do it in Google Sheets and it was a disaster. And I was like, I have hit a wall because I can't code and I want to make this fun project for myself. And so I was like, I had had the experience of like this wall code barrier in the past. Bubble reached out. I was tired of my job at big tech company, LinkedIn. Um, and I was impressed. I was like, this is not a bullshit startup. Like there's like other startups that like want me to help like brand credit cards for sports teams or something. And I was like, no, not super interested, but like bubble seemed really cool. Cause it was like such a massive mission. And I, I mean, I still work there. I think it's really cool. Like you get to see people make, um, apps in like an hour to help when it's like disaster relief, for example, like lost and found or like finding resources or like small towns that don't have Uber will make their own little bubble app. And like, there you go, <laughs> you know, um, so I joined Bubble because I had that project in my back of my head where I was like, I could make projects now on Bubble. Joined the company, super great job. Um, and then I was on Twitter and the first, like, I, I was already wanting to make a project. Like the first week when you join the company, they make you make an app. So you like learn right away how to use the product. Um, and I made like a music sharing app. Um, like a link sharing app actually. Then uh, Elon Musk bought Twitter and everyone was freaking out and they're like, oh my God, Twitter's gonna go down and like, we're gonna lose all our friends. And I had made like a number of friends at this point. <laughs> and I was like, no, I don't want to lose all my friends. So I made their space and it began as a Twitter alt. And Bubble's really easy. Like I made that, it's like very fast to make things like that. Um, Twitter alts, Airbnb alts. Like, it's like, that's the whole point. It's like easy to make apps like that, complex apps. Um, made a Twitter alt, got some friends on it, started hosting like Wednesday jam sessions to hang out. It was like this little, I made it as a safe haven in case Twitter went down so that my particular corner of Twitter could find me on third space and chat with me. And one day Twitter went down and everyone went on. Yeah, I remember that. I was there. It was so fun. Uh -huh. um, Good thing Twitter did not go down, still around. And good thing it's not dependent on third space because it's while it works, it's not that great. Mm. <laughs> um, like I built it, it's definitely kind of janky. Um, but then it evolved into like a creative space, which I was like, I get to make my own Twitter. What do I like want to see on Twitter? And it was like creative projects and like hosting and hanging out. So we had a really cute like social bubble scene there of like creative makers. People wrote so many essays. It was like a really nostalgic little space. Um, that was third space. Uh, what did I do next? I did cuties next. That being happened because my friend was telling me all of these horror stories of him going on dating, um, just going on dates from Hinge. And I was like, oh my God, you poor, poor man. Let me make you a dating app. And we'll, it was a joke. We're like, I'll make you a dating app and we'll just match all the girls with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we were just riffing. We were like in the Bay Area and I was like, ha 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 ha. He had told us all this horror story. We we're like, oh my God, that sounds awful. And like, I was like, let's just make you a dating app for you. And I was bored and I started making it. And I was like, spun up this little dating app as like a joke. And then I released it to Twitter <laughs> and people actually started using it. And the dating docs were going around. And I was like, date me docs are a little bit like, I don't know, like it's a lot, of, it's high effort. And part of why it might be seen as cringe is because it's high effort and like super earnest. And could we make something that is more standardized and easy like just put your photo up and like a few like tweets 
I'm a designer also. So I had all kinds of nits with the way dating apps function. I don't like swiping. I think it's transactional. Um, I don't like, um, I like that it's like a community-based app. So it's based off of people, you know, instead of like, here's this person that I never would have crossed paths with, except for the existence of this dating app. You know, like I wanted shared context. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, so I, both third space and cuties, I had a bit of a design opinion, right? Like third space was very wholesome and like, um, not gamified at all, which probably led to its downfall, <laughs> but like, um, yeah, cuties is still alive and well, there's like a couple here on our retreat. They met through my app. So Aww. cute. Um, Aww. that's cuties definitely going on. Um, and then I have plans to scale that too. Like cuties, I still am enjoying brainstorming on and then Twitter job board that one was probably my least successful app um everyone all my friends were unemployed all of them like last December every like I was like this is wild how like so many of my friends are unemployed and I like the idea of, like teapot economy and like working at jobs with people that you like and so I made the job board and it was kind of cool for like, I mean, it's still up, but like people put their like service consulting, like I do speech coaching or I do body work or like I do blah, blah. And they put them up and um, it was like a directory for people to offer each other services or post jobs that no one posted jobs. I think what I've learned is like the notification system is really important to get people like hooked and returning to the platform. And I it's like a big deal to build so I just haven't been doing that mm -hmm. um, yeah those mm -hmm. are my apps <laughs> what do you feel like you've learned from creating these apps what are some of the lessons or you know other things that you've learned from making them um things I've learned have I learned anything um have I learned anything? <laughs> Notifications. Definitely. <right? laughs> uh -huh. Notifications. Um, what else have I learned? Um, marketing, also important. Um, I've learned that I like building apps for my friends. Um, uh, something I learned from Third Space is that like, I was really hoping that it would take off and sustain itself, but it was really revolved around me. And like the fact that I was there and hosting events is what brought all my friends to hang out. And so it needs more of like a internal driver to keep things going. So cuties is nice because people want to like date. Mm -hmm. So they will go of their own accord. They will be driven by like loneliness to go <laughs> check it out, you know? <laughs> checks out, checks out. Yeah. Um, so I learned like you do need that kind of like motivating factor. Um, I probably learned that I have a bit of a technical wall that I can hit with building in bubble. I would I, many people have offered to help me, but they don't know how to use Bubble. They like are programmers, and I'm like, well, I need someone who's good at Bubble. Um, but yeah, I mean, I also think that if I devoted all of my time, I like still have other projects, and I like I work and stuff. Like if I really um, devoted all my time to it, I would probably have less bugs on my platform. Um, I've also learned, and I already knew this about myself, um, the initial excitement of starting something, I will like sink into. Like I spent so many hours on like, Third Space went through so many like revolutions. There used to be like this little community fire in the corner that you feed every time. <laughs> there used to be like <laughs> music sharing. There's like so many phases of me just like messing. I love that aspect of like, messing around, experimenting, creating things, testing it out. Uh, I've learned that I really don't like the part where I have to troubleshoot and debug and like, oh no, the filters don't work. 
make better filters. Like uh, I like struggle with the tail end of building like a final polished product. Um, but I have enough in my skill set to make something, it works, and people will try it out and play with it. Say this is a sort of thought experiment that's getting at a certain question from an interesting angle, but say five weeks from now, you got the bug and there was an idea for a new app that you wanted to make with Bubble. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you, how would you go about it that might be different than the ways that you've gone about the previous ones? Like what, what do you think you would be thinking about or how would you approach it? I would use AI. Hmm. Um, I am, I mean, that's kind of a cheat answer because I work in AI at my job. So um, it would just be way faster. I think it would be like way faster than even how fast I made it before, um, which was pretty, like the dating app, I made most of it in two days and the rest was just like extra bells and whistles. Um, but I would use AI for sure. Um, I would maybe do... If I make a more professional app, I think I would do more mapping out ahead of time of like, here are the designs, here's the brand identity, here's the data structure. Um, it's like a more formalized artifact instead of, so far it's like, I'm writing it out in my notes app. You know, I'm like, here are my thoughts. And I just like, that's the extent <laughs> of planning before I like get in and start building. Um, I would do more on APIs, plugins, notification systems. I would think a lot about pricing, monetization, because none of my apps make money. Um, and I would love to make money. <laughs> um, so probably that. I don't know. Like the app making is fun, but the film is definitely like more near and dear to like my heart. Um, app making is just something that I happen to like it's fun. It takes less emotional effort. I can just like sink into it and it's kind of like a video game. Um, yeah. <laughs> you talked about how one of the lessons that you learned was about marketing and how important that is. And um, yeah, I think one of the reasons I reached out now was I feel like, um, how to put it, watching you market cuties, especially, I feel like We've had a we've had a few nice exchanges recently where I'm like playing the game along with you. You know, you're like new what, and I'm like oh, yeah, cuties. Yeah, you know, yeah. uh, <laughs> and I feel like um, how to put this. I want I want to put this very carefully. Um, I think I've watched you learn something about marketing, where I think you're really good at marketing your projects, um, both like effectively, but also tastefully and like in a fun, lighthearted way. And um, I think a lot of people in Teapot care about their projects and want to market them, but it's like hard to find how to uh, market them in a way that like feels good and isn't sort of like yucky. And, um, you know, there are people that do this, but I've, I've kind of like watched you learn this lesson with your projects over time. And, um, you know, uh, I'm curious what it is that you've learned about marketing, how you would articulate it? Mm. Yeah, you know what? I don't even think of my new cuties tweets as marketing. Mm. And I think that's the point. It's like, because <laughs> I actually was, I think I said like a second ago, I should learn marketing. Mm. <laughs> like, I like, uh, was genuinely really excited about every new cutie on my app. And uh -huh. I was like, hey, and I was too like lazy to build a notification system. So uh -huh. I had to like let people know, you know, like. That's <laughs> like, good, like, clever, well done. Um, So yeah, I actually was talking with um rook on twitter about like i was like i want to get into this like indie maker space like i want to make my own apps and blah blah and he was like you should do it your own way like you shouldn't necessarily think about like needing to um same with i think film i noticed that as soon as i'm trying to do it the way it should be done it just kills all the joy and fun and i feel extremely stifled and like 
yeah, like I just like I can like feel like a lack of air. Um, whereas I like the idea of continuing to do things purely out of what organically arises like even the name cuties came because I kept being like new cutie like oh my god they're so cute you know and then I was like okay cuties um it's a good name yeah it was better than twitter dating (laughs) (laughs) pda yeah no but that's how it works I mean things are Tasha and ink was Tasha and ink to start with and now it's the service skill that like takes a little while to find find the thing yeah yeah um so I guess like the th- biggest lesson I've probably learned is to um, not think that you have to do it a certain way. Try to make it like natural to your personality and like authentic. And that's probably what marketing is. Honestly, it's like authentic just because I'm not trying. I don't feel like I'm trying to like. I don't know there's there aren't that many layers to it you know it's like me being like hey our homies on our app (laughs) you know it's like I don't know it's like very uh ground level joyful to have friends meet each other and collaborate or date or have fun hookups or whatever is going on it's like that's fun I'm happy for you uh yeah and I think like the swag also I, I had a lot of fun making it I was like I forget why I made the first one um I think I think once I renamed it to cuties I was like I have to make a cutie something like the, the it was just too like tempting so I made the hat and I had a lot of fun making swag and now people have these little pink hats <laughs> so uh-huh. um yeah Am I going to turn the other light on because it's sure. getting dark? Hmm. I'm thinking about the, um, you know, Mary and I in our empowerment work made this like spider diagram of like five qualities that we look for in a service project. And we've talked about two of them where, you know, you've talked about how it's really important for projects to be fun for you. And you also talked about how you really make sure to finish them, which is connected to what we would call like feasible, like, can you finish it? Make sure you finish it, finish the project. Um, And I'm thinking about the two other ones on the other side, which are like beneficial and ambitious. And um, like, is this a service project? Does it really help people? And yeah. Are you like growing through it? Is it getting bigger? Like, are you um, taking on increasing levels of challenge? And I feel like um, these are qualities I see you bringing to your projects where they're like kind of getting bigger and better every time. Like, I don't know. I think Cuties is like such a strong app. And I know the, when you were talking about third space, it seemed like um, almost like it was kind of like your sandbox to kind of like learn and mess around with like the community fire thing or like the me- music or like you kind of like got the hang of how to make an app there. And then you like used a lot of those lessons with the later apps. And um, I've seen that in, you know, every, everything we've talked about with your Twitter presence and so on. And uh, so, yeah, I've seen you grow in ambition and skill level and and so on over time. And then similarly, like these apps, especially, I think are really of service to the community where like, um, you know, third space, people were making like really beautiful connections and friendships there. And, you know, I, I don't know myself of any um, things that happened from the job board, but I'm sure that like, yeah, like gave people a chance to articulate their services, which is really valuable and be like, Hey, this is the thing I do. And I'm sure that helped people. And similarly, like cuties, like setting people up and their relationships that would come out of it and so on. Um, I So anyway, my question is, I wonder how you relate to those qualities of like ambition or or, or growth and challenge skill level over time and then also like benefit and service and helping people Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah as you were speaking I remember earlier I was talking about like inner work and like as like a theme and like some strategic element in like the community and I think um the service part probably comes easily because I am very friend motivated (laughs) friend and community motivated. And I think part of that is because I moved around so much as a kid 
that the home I found was friends that I would make in new locations and in community. So part of why Klein was a big deal is because it was, it was like a really small knit community and I could go to any city, which I often found myself like kind of uprooted and like some somewhere. And it's like, okay, I'll go to the climbing gym and I will meet people who I have mutual friends with. They will feel like my people and I can have this like home here. So just having such a good experience of community early on and having it really impact me, I think friends and community naturally feel like values that I hold really close to my heart because of the benefits I've received from it. And then, um, yeah, I don't know. Friends are always great. Like they're always making you laugh. <laughs> Just like, um, I think Visa is like friends of the meaning of life. And I was like, I had never thought of that before, but like maybe. And like, um, so I like part of the strategic part is also like, I've always wanted to introduce my friends to each other and like just continuing to strengthen the social fabric and like the community, the service driven apps is like, I'm just having, I'm just like the more of my friends date each other, the better, or like not necessarily, but like the more ties are being like strengthened and um, like created, the stronger the community and the network is. And the stronger the network is, the less burden there is on me or any particular node to keep in touch with everyone else. And the entire community just benefits. And uh, then we'll have friends forever. <laughs> so I don't know. That's like a service. It feels like pretty intuitive and easy, like that part of like a socially driven app. And um in terms of ambition, I mean, I feel like you've already heard me talk about how it's pretty fun driven. Like, um, if I don't feel like doing something, I often won't do it. Um, for in terms of creative projects, um, I have definitely some amount of persistence. Like, I, I'm kind of stubborn. So if I do start doing something, then I like have a hard time letting it go. And I do want to finish it. So like, that is part of like, I guess, ambition. Um, ambition is a weird word. I've always actually felt kind of uncomfortable with it because I feel like there's an ego side of that word, like an ego egoic connotation of like ambition for success or for a career or for external validation or blah, blah. And like my brand of ambition is probably more like Uh, the kind of high you get when you realize that you can make like a really big sandcastle. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like, I mean, if wait. you're fun motivated, then um, you can have more fun with bigger projects. If you, if you play your cards, right, it takes skill to do it well, but that's been my experience. It sounds like, yeah. Something that somewhere. I've been grappling with, if I become more like an indie maker, I've been doing research and it sounds like a really hard, <laughs> like, honestly, I was like, the more I read about it, the more I'm like, oh man, like there's like legal aspects. Like it's not just making things. Same with film. Once it becomes real, like I'm a real designer and I know the parts of my job that like kind of suck, like specking. Mm. I imagine if I go all the way in with like film or even like making a third space, like everything has its like boring aspects, you know? So I have to decide what's fun enough that I will put up with that. Um, but yeah. <laughs> Just want to digest that for a moment. I can feel a question I want to ask and take a second to find the words. Hmm. Yeah, you talked about not liking the connotations of the word ambition and it being sort of like ego driven or needing validation. And then I wonder if you could say more about your own experience of finding ambition within yourself or something that like that word points to, but like what your own experience of something in that territory is like, if if any. 
Mm, I mean, and I, also I'll just add like that I, I see you as ambitious in a way that I think is good, that I admire, that I think is virtuous. So I'm, I'm just like, that's part of where the question is, is coming from. It's just like, what's, what's working for you? Like, what's that like for you? I think I actually struggle with, and like, I struggle with the normal kind of ambition quite a lot. Like I get a lot of feedback around, like, you aren't visible enough. You need more like, um, like leadership opportunity like uh you need to be I, I don't know like I I like have a really hard time with like speaking for the sake of speaking or like doing things for the sake of like show or something like that um I do the best when I'm speaking for some kind of content um so things that are for example one classic example of like some kind of ambition or success that people do is like oh I want to be like I don't know like Forbes 30 under 30 like you have some kind of like badge and I actually have a hard time with that kind of ambition because I just don't I like almost like lose momentum like I, I'm like at a loss for words I'm like okay like what's the point again like or like what I guess it's good from like perception standpoint. Um, I think it's honestly because I'm extremely internally, like intrinsically motivated that, um, yeah, the, the whole argument of if you have, if you speak at a conference, people will think you're cool. Like that doesn't feel as, it doesn't like land because I don't know everything that other people think is subject to change like they could think I'm cool one second and then not the other second and like it just doesn't feel like stable whereas like if I find something I find a cool leaf I don't know cool idea and I'm like no one else thinks it's cool but I think it's cool I'm very stable <laughs> you know what I mean like it's like I will like I place value in what I place value in. And if I have someone else place value on it, then it's very unstable for me because they can change their minds because they are themselves, you know? So um, I have a hard time with like usual kinds of markers of ambition or success um, in terms of like, what, is, what was it? You're asking like, what is it like to be, internally ambitious or something yeah or what's what's your relationship to whatever that is in your territory I think that, that my sense in this conversation is like that's a word that has connotations that don't really work for you and like but um it's like a handle for something that um yeah. I see you as manifesting regardless and so I wonder what that's like for you internally I think I probably use the word like I think I, I am more like inspiration based. Mm. I'm extremely inspired. Mm. Um, and I'm also very like, I visualize and I'm like future thinking. Like it's easy for me to visualize a future or like visualize something that can exist. And that I find like almost addicting. It's like that could happen. I can imagine it. I can taste it. I can touch it but I can't quite touch it, but I could touch it. <laughs> like that kind of can drive me nuts a little bit. And then I'm like, it's like so close. I like talk about avail a lot where like there is the world of things that don't exist yet, but like, and there's like things that are closer to the veil versus farther away from the veil. And when things come close enough to the veil, us humans on the other side of the veil can feel their near existence and when you can when you are the closest person to that object on the other side of the veil and you can feel that near existence it's like you could just reach out and bring it into the world and it would exist and this is totally a thing that can happen you can like totally make things exist and that's like uh, i find that very like exciting and um yeah i, I think like also like kind of having a constant stream of inspiration like consuming books content film and like seeing the other people who have 
lived before you and have made things before you that really speak to your soul that I find like existentially like um it's like a balm right I'm like wow like I feel so seen and recognized and how cool and mind-blowing that they went and wrote that (laughs) or like that they went and just like made that film and I'm like so happy that it exists and I feel like I want to almost like be a part of that like movement or like motion and write back to them or like um I don't know. It feels, um, that is a type of ambition that I'm like, um, drawn towards. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. Thanks for following that through. And (laughs) I loved hearing how you framed those. Thank you. Um, you spoke a few times about, um, a kind of value with your projects of making them mutually supportive and like sort of being strategic about them. And I think I've seen a thread or two about this from you, but I'm curious if you could speak to that and how you think about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a whole little like area of like life lessons or something. I wrote this article on building a self-reinforcing life. Right. And yeah, this is like a maybe like the whole strategy area. Um, So where to start? Um... Maybe in my early 20s, I started to notice, I started to like learn things, right? One thing I learned is that like your context really matters. So where you live and the types of things you're exposed to and the air that you are exposed to will shape a million decisions that you make every day. Um, So it's very important that you choose your context. Another thing I noticed is that things compound. Um, So time compounds if you don't do anything time will still compound like I don't know if you eat like if you do one thing every day without thinking about it but you do it every day there will be some kind of compounding effect where you have now done it every day for like five years and like that is somehow your niche now like this is like this there is a motion to it financially right things compound you can just stick it savings account and it will grow over time and like that was something I found really compelling that it also tied in with this idea that I came across about knowledge and that you shouldn't just necessarily learn things like scattered leaves. You should place them on the branches and on the tree and then like put them in reference and that will help you make sense of the world. And that analogy, I think a lot in like metaphors and analogies that metaphor helped me a lot to like start organizing my thoughts a little bit more or like things in the world like this in relation to that is a way for me to be more oriented in the world um and so tying and I took a strategy class that talked about southwest airlines and how they had a strategic map and the way that their like competitive advantage came from these carefully placed tactics around like free seating, um, no like um, like quick turnarounds and stuff like that. And like they made this web that all together led to a competitive advantage. Like the free seating also led to a faster turnaround time, which also led to some kind of like financial benefit, which also like they had this whole web. Um, And that all of those various things also read pattern language and that was about like um finding like organic patterns um or like like a pattern that doesn't breathe life into the world or your like um versus like a pattern that does that, that does breathe life and like part of the difference is um a pattern that is like um, more alive and heal the larger pattern it lives with and um, it holds within it. And so all of that together, I was like thinking about my life and I was like, um, I want 
things that I do to compound and also be sort of like leaves on branches <laughs> and that they feed into each other and create some kind of web of competitive advantage for myself. And I want it to be placed in a way that I am like connected to larger organizations and helping things that I can help. And I wanted it all to make sense and build towards something over time. So yeah, I don't know if this is making sense, but that's kind of like a lot of the ways that I live my life are with that in mind of like, I don't want things to just be random like they should have a strategic like framework to it and like build towards something yeah what are some specific ways you've implemented those ideas in your projects um i would say less in my well you could say my projects but more in like building my life mm -hmm. uh, so like Another thing about the whole reinforcing system is climbing felt so reinforcing to me. Like the fact that I go climbing, I go to the gym and I get physical exercise, right? That when I go and get physical exercise, I also get social stimulation. When I make friends, I also, that also motivates me to go back to the gym and get exercise um those friends also motivate me to go outdoors and now I get nature like access to nature and like access to nature also feeds the spiritual aspect of climbing which climbing already has and it's like everything is like these feedback loops that feed each other and so I wanted I saw that in climbing I was like wow this one hobby feeds like seven needs of mine in one go it's so great um, and I wanted more things like that. Um, bubble, the reason why I joined is because I could tell it would feed my creative side, like not just as a designer, but like my side projects. And I was like, okay, now my job actively teaches me how to make side projects and my side projects actively teach me how to make my product better. Um, so I try to like create these like little loops where I'm like everything, like my friends and my books, like they all are always, they're like, they're putting me into like a positive spiral so that I gain energy from talking to people that I surround myself with. And by gaining energy, I have more creative impetus. And that also gives me more things to talk to people about. And like, I just, when everything is working together like that, um, it runs really smoothly. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Um, Are there any specific piece of advice you'd give someone to set up mutually supportive feedback loops like that in their own life? Like how would someone go about doing that? Drains. I'll look for leakages. Hmm. What are things that are leaking or draining or like aren't feeding anything else or are like one off abandoned, like little areas. Um, friends are so important. My friends are really supportive and they care about me. That's so important. If you have friends who are like, not supportive they can shit on your projects and then like you know it's like okay like I've just lost like <laughs> and I just lost momentum and then oh. that's like a, you know what I mean mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like um also like friends who care about you not just friends who like are there for status or who think you're cool that's really important like for example I'll do projects and I'll fail all the time my friends are so nice. They're like, oh, it's okay. Like you fuck around and you find, you know, <laughs> they're like really nice about it. And it's also like, and it's not that me failing doesn't do some damage because it does. Every time someone there's like a little bit of like, oh, like, I don't know. There is like, you did do something and like not make it. But if they care about you, then there's like this mentality of like, forgiveness and care and it doesn't matter because they're like support you and they it's not about like your success or failure it's about you as a human being and like that's what matters so try again you know <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah um also people will have jobs that drain them 
And I talk about how my job will often like inspire me to do more work, like creative work and my creative work will inspire me to do my job. Like that kind of thing is nice instead of I just worked and now I'm drained and I have no energy for my creative projects, you know, hmm. so. How would someone go about finding a job that energizes them in that way? Yeah. Um, pick a job that you actually believe in that with people you actually like. I used to say like, it's like the product, the mission and the people like the product and the types of problems you solve, you have to find interesting, the people you have to like, and the mission you have to believe in. Um, and even then you still might not like job, uh, working a job because who likes working? Um, so uh, I don't know, I, I guess like I had a whole spreadsheet, <laughs> make a big spreadsheet, find like the location you wanna work in, the industry you want to work in the role you like do like a million cross references and then you start to narrow things down mm. um mm. yeah <laughs> i can't be the only like I, people people do this i know many people do this kind of thing mm -hmm. like so, um it's like <laughs> look at it and isn't even like it's like in knowing yourself and knowing what you want at all and like the emotional blockages of like I kind of want to do this but it feels really intimidating or vague or for some reason I'm scared I don't know and I think like that is often the bigger blocker than making a spreadsheet and like figuring out the best like intersection of everything. Um, mm. So, yeah. Mm. If we were to fast forward five years from now and you're living your best life, uh, you're really pleased with what you see when you fast forward, uh, what <laughs> kinds of things would you like the next five years of your life to oh involve <laughs> such that you're really pleased with how that time goes. I'm like high pressure. <laughs> oh, no pressure. I can also ask it a different way if this particular form of question is. No, 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 no. Uh -huh. I'll say it. I'll say uh -huh. it. We'll see how I feel in five years when I look back on this. Uh -huh. Okay. Man, this is intense. Um, I'll probably not be working a normal job. I think I still want to like, I have like one more milestone I wanna hit, but like, I don't think I want to be working like a normal job. I would be, um, okay, best case scenario, okay. Um, That's the one. <laughs> best case scenario. I am, um, Maybe like four things. Um, so first thing is I've done film school and I've made films that I like a lot that speak to my perspective and my like aesthetic and things that I think are really cool. They can be experimental films, but I've made like a little like little coterie of experimental films. And maybe done film school, but like the more important thing is like having made a bunch of little like these little films that I like a lot. Um, second, I have become some kind of like independent maker, like indie creator maker, um, and I've sold some apps, <laughs> and they are sustainable and they make me money, and that's my money maker. Like I can charge through them and they serve cool niche causes for communities that I feel like causes that I feel um, tied to or like that I like want the best for. Um, that's really hard. That's like a really hard one to actually build and sell successful apps and have them be sustainable and 
ideally not too much of a hassle. Like I don't want to have to, like, I would love for them to either be sustainable or sold, you know, I don't have to like work at it. Um, I don't want to like be running a company, you know, just like making these apps. Third, I would love to have written a bunch. Um, I'm already writing like essays and stuff. Um, but again, I kind of suffer from like, I have the uh, action orientation, but not necessarily the polish orientation. So like, um, uh, yeah, I would love to have written a bunch of essays and maybe like turned it into like an ebook and um, for it to be at enough level of polish that I feel good about it. Um, that would be awesome. And then fourth, this is like a trailing like thing in the back of my head, but like um, I'd love to have built something tangible on a community standpoint and sort of a third space or like an art center or like something that encourages experimentation and exploration of novel ideas and is a space that brings people together who are like intellectually curious and kind and whatnot. Um, oh, and hopefully I have a guy that I'm really into and want to marry and have probably hopefully be marrying by that point. And what else? Um, <laughs> there is one more thing. Uh, was there anything else? Yeah, maybe preparing for kids or something. Oh, maybe climbing. Maybe I'll have climbed like a lot of the projects that I really wanted to climb in like Kentucky and elsewhere. <laughs> there mm. you go. <laughs> Very beautiful. I can feel it coming for you, it arising. <laughs> the future so. is here already. We are five years from now watching this back and saying, ah, yes. Check, check, I knew check. It all. <laughs> I knew it all. My intuition was so spot on. My five or six things. <laughs> or it worked out even better than I thought it would. I cared about this thing, but actually this worked out even better. Yeah. <laughs> May it be so. I would love to have a lot of the same friends that I have. Like I would want it to continue the snowballing effect. Mm -hmm. Like I do feel like a very large, like it's kind of like Visa's domino thing. Like I mm -hmm. do feel like a snowballing and I would love that to continue. So yeah. Amen. Oh. <laughs> well, we've covered a lot of territory. I wonder if there's anything you'd like to dive more deeply into or talk more about or anything else you'd like to converse about. Um, what is stickiest for you? What were you like, huh? Like that's something I'm gonna mull on or like Oh my um, gosh, so many things. Um I loved what you said about like using Twitter as just talking to yourself. And like, I think, I don't know, I think about like five or six times a year, I'm like, wow, I should really tweet more. I really need to tweet more. I don't tweet enough. And I've been in one of those moods and um, that's inspiring for me. And uh, yeah, I think there's something about marketing that I'm chewing on about how to, mm. I think I have a lot of constraints and values about how I want to market my own projects that um, I have to find my own way win to. Really loved what you said about fun. Um, I was just preaching, preaching my my gospel right here. I'm all about fun and uh, <laughs> preaching to the choir. Um, mm. It's like fun, but also not fun. Like, like, like when I talk about making films, it's fun, and also you hear me talk about banging my head against the wall. Mm, you know, mm -hmm. like it is actively grueling. Mm -hmm. But it has to be still fun enough. It's like a no-brainer to keep doing it. Um, totally. Yeah. Totally. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, those were some of the things that really stood out to me. And I'm, I'm going to be chewing on in the future. There, there is a lot more as well. But those are, those are some things. Yeah. Nice. Um, nice. I think I think one of the things I'm also chewing on in this conversation is like. The empowerment work that Mary and I do and you know you were in our empowerment give your gift program and are in that community and um how to put it I think 
I think, you know, you talked about the snowball effect and like how things are just working for you and they're just getting bigger and bigger. And I see that happening for you. And I see that happening for some other people in, in the teapot sphere. And um, I guess one way to put it is I'd like to help more people have that kind of domino effect where um, mm -hmm. things are just growing and growing for them and everything supporting everything. And I see that happening for you and I see that happening for others. And I want to kind of like both reverse engineer what's happening there and see how I can, how I'm in a position to help people do that. Yeah, that's fascinating. I do think there's a lot of um uh I, like when I talked about the getting to a point of self-love and being enough is like I mean, not only that, but like um introspection, like knowing what you care about is going to be critical to having any kind of snowball effect otherwise you will snowball down the wrong ladder up the wrong ladder you know what mm -hmm. i mean mm -hmm. and then you'll be like oh shit i'm successful and sad um but it would be really interesting to do like how to get the what are the points like you you made like a map right of like creative progression but i think that could even be Maybe something interesting there that's not just for, like for making larger creative projects, but also like creating this system that works for you, that builds upon itself for you. And what are the different aspects of it? Like social, I think that what I've observed with a lot of people who get stuck um, with like motivation or like momentum or something is that they're more socially motivated. So putting them in like a social environment is more important for them because then they like get a lot out of friends helping each other do things. Whereas I'm like more of the kind that's okay, like in my room doing things on my own. Um, but yeah, that's fascinating. I think that would be a really fun like um, map to make. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think there's a way in which because um we're in this network and in this, you know, uh, what micro solidarity would call like a congregation. Like we're in this informal, emergent, larger sphere of people who are pretty intertwined. Like it's pretty obvious to me that um, like your success is my success and someone else's success who's in the network is like all of our success. And so um, I really want, maybe that's part of it too, is like, I see the snowball happening this snowball effect happening here and there for like individual people, but it's not, and there are really good group trends. Like there are definitely really good group trends I could point to, like, you know, the fact that so many events are happening and like people are really gathering in person, but I, I want to see more of that kind of like, I mean, this is it for me with ambition. It, it does have that quality of like addictiveness and it getting bigger over time and in an actually really wholesome way, I think. And yeah. I'd like to see, um, so I'm always wanting more and it's like, oh, I want to see that snowball effect happening for more people and then um, the ways in which uh, that is mutually supportive for all the people who are in the network. Yeah. Yeah. And that makes me wonder, like, so you mentioned like all the events that are happening, like that's one example of things like starting a snowball or fire, like what are other signs that you would want to see or have been seen in previous similar situations you know and like maybe it's like creating a lot of things or creating bigger and better things like I definitely see the events ramping up like everyone's mm -hmm. between last year and this year everyone is hanging out like mm -hmm. I feel like and like everyone is like dating and I don't know <laughs> everyone's constantly hanging out <laughs> it's just uh -huh. like I'll see the same people in like SF and New York. And I'm like, oh, wow. Like I'm about to see you in Berlin. Like, <laughs> it's really cool. Totally. Yeah. I think a few things come to mind of like, um, mm, yeah, marriage, like people getting married, people having kids. Yeah. Um, I think Fractal like is a really strong node in New York and like Sheik just did Portal and stuff like that. And, you know, Berlin's been kind of a hotspot over the years, San Francisco and like more yeah. stability in the nodes. Um, mm -hmm. I'd also really like to see more people. Um, I, 
I think we kind of have to LARP this one. I have, I have a tweet about that, about like we have to LARP our way into it. But like, I'd like to see people able to financially support themselves more through this work. Yeah. And like, I, I know I'm not, I'm like halfway to being sustainable just myself, let alone mm-hmm. all the people that I work with. And um, I think I, my headcanon is that's going to like, you know, what Visa says, show up, don't die, don't quit. Like if I just keep going, I think it'll work and the p- puzzle pieces will come together. But I'd like to see that be possible for more and more people. And I think I think you're a really interesting example in that way that like you've made it work by doing bubble as your full time job for a while. And like that's mutually you've constructed that carefully to be supportive to your other projects and more things like that could be good. Or I don't know I think there there's there's space for almost like improvisation and in how could it be possible to find livelihood in an Internet connected community? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, because I, I also think about like the organizations that do exist, like Art of the Accomplishment or like um like Inter Intellect, like there's like there are kind of like organizations. I would love to see like more teapot economy or like maybe like actual companies that mm-hmm. are like friends working with each other. Uh that would be super interesting. Um mm. I think it already exists to some extent with like the smaller products that people are making but um yeah I liked how you outlined that hmm. Hmm. um cool anything else you'd like to talk about or dive more deeply into um no not really hmm. I feel like we had a really long meandering <laughs> fruitful conversation <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> That's my favorite kind. It's long, meandering, and fruitful. Yeah. yeah. Uh we have to had that indeed. And I so appreciate you being so generous with your time and uh your heart, really sharing your experiences and how you see things. And I've been really energized by this conversation. And I, I um the last thing I'll say is like, hmm, I think there's something about my relationship to generosity that I want to be get it get better at articulating to people, like what my felt lived experience of that is and i'm going to try now to say something about that and that i really find being able to listen to you and ask you questions is a gift that you've given me personally and me asking you questions is a gift i've tried to give you and um paying attention to you and, and really trying to see you and us sharing this conversation with the world is a gift that I think we're giving to the world. And as these kinds of conversations close, I just feel so proud to be sharing this with the world as a gift. Like, I think we made something really beautiful here that's of great benefit to many people for a long time. So thank you for being part of that. Yeah, thank you for having me. I definitely see the web you are weaving with Mm -hmm. this podcast, Mm -hmm. especially when I was going through and watching my other friends' podcasts, I was like, this is so cool and mm. gets cooler with each episode that you add. So mm. um thank you for offering your gifts. Mm. <laughs> to, Pleasure to, to be doing it with you, friend. Yeah. <laughs> mm.